the slide here, no, please. Um, one second, one second. Slide show and all. Please, Kiran, come here. Come, I'm doing here. Oh, good. Not everything is showing. The top part of the slide is not showing. One second, one second. No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> All the slides are coming properly. Yeah, yeah, coming the coming. rest of it. Just check. I'll do. Yeah. No, the next one. Let me just try and do it again. No, no, sorry. But after that, I will be changing the slides, isn't it? I just want to check. Is it on? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, this is uh, Anita Ranjan Singh from Ramaya Institute of Management. And here I am to talk to you, share with you uh, staffing decisions in ME subsidiaries. The world's 500 largest companies generated $32.7 trillion in revenues and $2.15 trillion in profits in 2018, since the first MNC, East India Company, set up in 1601, headquartered in London. Last year, in 2019, Fortune Global 500 companies together employ 69.3 million people worldwide and are represented by 34 countries. Let us look at the top 10 multinational corporations in the world as of 2019 based on consolidated revenue listed by Fortune Global 500. The top place is Walmart in the United States the consolidated revenue of $514 billion. The second place is Sinopec Group from China, and China also stands at the fourth and the fifth place with China National Corporation, Petroleum and State Grid Corporation. At the third place is Royal Dutch Shell. At the fifth is from Saudi Arabia, Saudi Aramco, followed by British Petroleum from United Kingdom, Exxon Mobil from United States, Volkswagen from Germany, and at the 10th place is Toyota Motors from Japan. So what is an ME? Multinational corporation can be defined as an enterprise that engages in foreign direct investments and which owns or to a certain extent controls value-added activities in several countries. This definition was given by Dunning and London. Multinational companies exist in a variety of forms, ranging from small companies that invest abroad to large groups that manage subsidiaries in an important number of countries. Today, the boundaries between an m and &E and its environment has become loose. I'll explain how it goes. Foreign subsidiaries frequently cooperate with local companies and interact autonomously with other actors in their local business environment. For example, it could be suppliers, distributors. 
uh, clients and governments, etc. MNCs are thus embedded in multiple networks, which are likely to evolve over time according to the local environments where they operate. MNEs do recognize that human resources play an important role in developing and sustaining a competitive advantage in today's highly competitive global business environment. While all aspects of managing human resources are important, in particular, staffing of foreign subsidiaries continues to be an important strategic human resource practice that MNEs use to develop and sustain competitive advantage in the international marketplace. However, strategic staffing of host country operations remains of the primary management challenges facing most MNEs today. The critical question regarding staffing these key positions, so we'll be focusing mostly on the key positions in MNC host subsidiaries relates to whether such positions should be filled by local talent or by expatriate talent sourced from elsewhere in the parent company. So who are expatriates? They are employees of MNCs who are sent on international assignments to host country subsidiaries for a defined period of time to accomplish a variety of organizational objectives and who are scheduled to return to either a home-based or another international assignment upon completion of their assignments. The forms and durations of international assignments have been evolving and this is to meet the changing demands of the global economy. The high costs of managing and supporting parent country nationals on foreign assignments have led to increased pressures for cost containment to stay competitive. While expatriates continue to be utilized by most MNCs in order to perform mission critical functions ranging from strategic control and global coordination of subsidiaries to facilitating knowledge sharing and transfer across national borders. However, firms are more actively exploring ways to effectively utilize third country nationals and host country nationals. So let's look at how, how the MNCs staff the, sub the subsidiaries. MNCs can staff their foreign subsidiaries with, the, they have various choices and options and we will be seeing through this presentation, how do they decide on the staffing options that they have between parent country nationals, host country nationals, third country nationals, and what are called transnational or global managers. Let us try and understand the difference between them, the, the, what we had listed earlier. Uh, trying to define uh, parent country nationals, they are employees of the MNE who are citizens of the country where the firm's corporate headquarters is located. They basically have three fundamental competencies. They have familiarity with the firm's corporate culture. They have the ability to actively communicate with headquarters and ability to maintain control, which is very important over the subsidiaries operations. In general, the presence of PCNs in a subsidiary provides some assurance that the subsidiary, assurance to the headquarter, to the MNC headquarter that the subsidiary will comply with MNE strategic objectives, policies, and goals. On the other hand, host country nationals are employees of the MNE who work in the foreign subsidiary and are citizens of the country where the foreign subsidiary is located itself. They are generally recognized as having two core competencies. They have familiarity with the cultural, economic, political, legal environment of the host country, and they also have the ability to respond effectively 
to the host country's requirements for localization of the subsidiary's operations. However, they lack familiarity with, with the parent country culture because they are from the host country and hence they lack this familiarity. However, this deficiency can be addressed through socializing the HCNs at the parent country headquarters. So what is socialization? Is the process by which HCNs learn about the corporate culture and become acquainted with the values and behaviors expected of them, expected by the headquarter. They can be socialized in a variety of ways, for example, training, mentoring, coaching, and observing other employees. Basically, they are observing the PCNs uh, when the PCNs are posted in the subsidiaries. Socialization at the m &E headquarters allows HCNs to develop competencies which are similar to those developed by the parent country nationals. Such HCNs who have been socialized at the parent country headquarter are also referred to as impatriates. So let's see, finally, third country nationals are employees of the firm who are neither the citizen of country where the m and &E is headquartered, nor citizens of the country where the foreign subsidiary is located. They are generally viewed as some kind of compromise between the PCNs and the HCNs. On the one hand, PCNs are less expen expensive to maintain as compared to the PCNs because the, the compensation of the PCNs are far higher than those of any others like PCNs or HCNs. But on the other hand, the TCNs lack familiarity with the host country culture and at the same time, the firm's corporate culture. But just like the HCNs, even the TCNs can be socialized at the parent country headquarters to develop familiarity with the firm's corporate culture and can be socialized at the host country subsidiary to develop familiarity with the cultural, economic, political, and legal environment of the host country. In addition, TCNs can also be socialized at the regional headquarters to develop familiarity with the cultural norms of the specific geographic regions. Uh, for example, we can talk about Mercosur, which is the countries which are included under this arrangement is uh, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay. The other regional could be SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation and some of the countries that are included under it is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. There's another important group of international employees that is available to the m &E, the transnational or the global manager. This manager is totally immersed in the MNC's operational strategy and is comfortable in all regions. While limited in numbers, there are not many global managers. Not everybody becomes a global manager in a multinational corporation. So they are limited in number because of the unique set of competencies and therefore they are somewhat costly. And global managers, however, often offer an important choice to the m &E. So why do we have been saying that the expatriates do cost the company much more than the TCNs or the HCNs? By expatriate, we mostly refer to the PCNs. So why do multinationals use expatriates anyway? There are prohibitive costs associated with moving the staff since a large part of the cost involves premium salaries and benefits required to sustain expatriates and their families in the host country. MNCs used expatriates because regardless of their positions or scopes of responsibilities, they perform strategic or critical functions for subsidiary operations. So it's because of their strategic and critical functions, even though they are more costly to maintain and sustain MNCs still use them. 
originally identified by Edstrom and Galbraith. The reason for transferring staff across borders are for filling a position, management development, and organization development. Let's look at what are these three reasons for transferring expatriates. Uh, organization development infers that expatriate can be used as part of an MNC's global control and coordination strategy. And in this category, it's basically the senior or the executive international positions and uh, they are sent abroad to fill critical position, positions with strategic decision making responsibilities. So it's because of their strategic functions that they carry out in terms of control and coordination of the subsidiary that expatriates are sent. The second motive for international assignment is to fill positions, which mainly is about transfer of firm specific knowledge. That could be the, the knowledge could be the technology from the headquarter to the subsidiary, transferring the technology. So they use expatriates to transfer technology and competencies from the headquarter to the host countries. The third and the final motive for international assignments is management development, which is concerned with exposing high potential and competent managers to international experience and preparing them for future executive positions. Staffing impacts subsidiary performance and hence it is important. Staffing has been strategic for MNEs as expatriates in the top management rung impact subsidiary performance. Reflecting this importance, let us try to understand the factors determining senior position subsidiary staffing decisions. Should they be staffed by expatriates or by the host country nationals? So I have uh, put some of the determinants here. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is, I decided to some of the important determinants of subsidiary staffing. Uh, they are MNE's competitive strategy, cultural similarity or dissimilarity between the parent country and the subsidiary country, managerial orientation at the headquarters, the subsidiary age, which is also the firm's host country experience, then ownership, ownership by the parent company, ownership of the subsidiary by the parent company, and MNE's country of origin. Let's start with the first one. MNE's competitive strategy is defined as the dominant strategy used to balance the dual needs of standardization and localization. The three generic competitive strategies that MNEs can use to integrate their worldwide subsidiaries are the global strategy, multi domestic strategy, and region specific strategy. Staffing composition should support an organization's competitive strategy. Again, different competitive strategies require different employee role behaviors and skills to implement them. For example, uh, staffing composition that is weighted towards PCNs will provide the subsidiary with knowledge about the MNE's corporate culture with respect to goals, objectives, and policies. In contrast, a subsidiary composition that is weighted towards HCNs will provide the subsidiary, obviously, with the knowledge of the local host country, which is cultural, economic, political, and legal environment of the host country. MNEs following a global strategy aim to achieve efficiency through integrating a series of linked subsidiaries across different countries. Since a firm's competitive position in one country is strongly affected by its position in other countries, a higher intensity of integration required between the subsidiary and parent headquarters 
leads to the need for higher levels of control, which in turn increases the demand for internal consistency. So some of the examples I could think of global strategy firms with global strategy would be Coca-Cola and Apple. So these subsidiaries, for example, Apple, which follows a global strategy, is more likely to staff its subsidiary with PCNs, which is parent country nationals, or host country nationals or third country nationals who have been socialized at the parent country headquarters because they provide a better fit in understanding the, the global strategic trust of the parent firm. So we see here, uh, the picture here is of Isabel Guimahe. She is uh, the, present, the present vice president and managing director of Greater uh, China. She is based in Shanghai um, of Apple. So Apple with a global strategy. Uh, she joined Apple in 2008 as the vice president of wireless technologies, and she played a key role besides other uh, roles. She played a key role in developing a new China specific features from iPhone uh, for iPhone and iPad. Earlier, she was the vice president of wireless software engineering at Palm in California. Uh, so that makes her a PCN. She has been working for Apple, parent country national. But what is interesting here is she is of the Chinese origin and she is based at the moment currently in China. And she has been socialized in the parent country. So strategically, Apple has um, staffed its Greater China operations with the vice president of Chinese origin, who has been a PCN, however, who has been socialized. Uh, she's, she studied in, in the US and Canada. Um, she grew up in China, has moved to uh, the US and Canada for her studies. So uh, she is a PCN however, of Chinese origin. Firms following a region-specific strategy focus on specific geographic regions as one market, and they customize products and services to best serve the needs of a particular region. Because m and need to integrate various subsidiaries in that particular specific region, TCNs who have been socialized at the regional headquarters provide a better fit by virtue of their familiarity with the conditions of the specific region. So, you know, region specific, there are many uh, companies, MNEs, which follow this region specific strategy. So, uh, they could be, for example, um, the region could be Asia Pacific region. And some companies may have their regional headquarters, for example, in Japan or in Korea for the Asia Pacific region. There may be other European region or the Middle East or the African region. On the other hand, MNEs following a multi domestic strategy decentralize their operations that are relatively independent of each other. The strategic need for local responsiveness necessitates employing host country nationals who have been socialized at the local subsidiary because HCNs have a better fit by virtue, obviously, of uh, virtue of their natural familiarity with the local conditions. Some of the MNEs with um, multi domestic strategy could be uh, KFC, Pizza Hut, McDonald's who have been customizing its products to the tastes and preferences of its customers. What we have here in the, the picture is Rahul Shinde. He is the general manager of KFC Greater Asia and is based in Gurgaon. 
However, he was the earlier MD of KFC India and uh, from 2015 to 17 and he was elevated uh, to the global role of divisional chief financial officer in, in the US. So Rahul Shinde, a host country national who was transferred to the US as the divisional chief, chief financial manager. At the same time, he socialized with the parent country, uh, the parent um, culture of the m and &E, and is now back again as the general manager, KFC Greater Asia. So he would be a host country national who has been socialized in the parent country of KFC. Another factor determining subsidiary staffing, it is cultural similarity between the national culture of the country where the MNE's headquarter is located and the national culture of the country where the foreign subsidiary is located. So overall, high cultural similarity between the ME headquarters and foreign subsidiaries will decrease the intensity of integration required by the ME. And to address this intensity of integration, MEs will prefer employing HCNs and PCNs, PCNs who have a greater supplementary fit with the values of the local environment. So HCNs we can understand. So when there is a smaller, the cultural similarity is high, for example, between uh, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or we could also think of, you know, Portugal and Brazil. Uh, to some extent, they have, to some extent, they have cultural similarity because of the language, Portuguese language, but then they may be still quite different in other ways. So high cultural similarity, uh, when there is, the MNEs prefer employing HCNs, TCNs, and PCNs who have greater supplementary fit with the local environment. This is often achieved, again, by socializing them in the host country. However, low cultural similarity, or rather, it's also called cultural dissimilarity between the m and &E headquarters and the foreign subsidiaries will increase the intensity of integration required by the organization. And to meet this, the firms are more likely to use the, either the parent country nationals or if that is not the option that is available, they may use host country nationals and third country nationals who have been socialized at the parent country headquarter. Uh, these HCNs and TCNs who have been socialized in the parent country headquarters are, as we have uh, mentioned earlier, they are also called impatriates. Uh, I could think of uh, Ford India, which uh, appointed Anurag Mehrotra as MD of its Indian subsidiary. So he would be an HCN who is socialized in the parent country headquarters and where there is no cultural similarity between Ford, which is headquartered in the US and India. So the cultural dissimilarity between the parent country and the host country required that Ford India has an HCN who is socialized in the parent country headquarters and hence it appointed Anurag Mehrotra as the MD of its Indian subsidiary. These managers who have been socialized at the parent country headquarters have internalized the values and goals of the parent firm. And because of the shared values and goals, these employee types are likely to act in accordance with the parent's strategic intent and they are more trusted by the headquarters. Staffing subsidiaries with these managers 
may be a low cost cultural control mechanism that grants subsidiaries flexibility in choosing actual course of actions to achieve its parent objectives the fit of values and goals between the headquarters and these employees help the firm in three ways let's see how one it improves the coordination between subsidiaries and headquarter two it exerts implicit cultural control over the culturally distant subsidiaries and finally third it ensures that the subsidiary behaves in accordance with the parent values and goals let us understand how managerial orientation at the multinational headquarters impacts staffing managerial orientation let's try to define what it is it refers to the attitude of the top managers at the firm's headquarters towards managing and staffing subsidiaries so managerial orientation at headquarters however may interact with the competitive strategy to determine subsidiary staffing composition according to pearl muter 1969 there are uh, uh, the managerial orientations that are listed below ethnocentric polycentric geocentric and regiocentric uh, ethnocentric orientation to subsidiary staffing results in key positions being filled by headquarters management personnel in other words pcns a polycentric orientation to staffing is one in which the subsidiaries are managed by local nationals in other words hcns a geocentric approach to staffing utilizes the best people for the key jobs throughout the organization regardless of citizenship and these would be the global managers finally a regiocentric orientation to staffing is similar to the geocentric orientation but utilizes the best people in the given specific region a uh, mna with an ethnocentric managerial orientation considers headquarters working methods and culture as being superior and that's why they are called ethnocentric superior and decisive for the management of subsidiaries this type of orientation will increase the intensity of integration required by the mne and hence pcns tcns and hcns who have been socialized at the parent country headquarters are more likely to fill key positions because of their high supplementary fit with the parent firm's values so uh, let's see here the mne with ethnocentric managerial orientation global strategy is likely to use pcns with regio specific strategy is likely to use more likely to use the third country nationals who are socialized in the parent country and with the multi domestic strategy they are more likely to use hcns who are socialized in the parent country headquarters moving on to polycentric mnes that follow a polycentric managerial orientation acknowledge variations in cultural values and norms across borders this managerial orientation reduces the overall intensity of integration and as a result hcns or tcns are most appropriate to manage subsidiaries because they have a better knowledge and skills and ability so mnes with polycentric managerial orientation global strategy are likely to use hcns who are socialized in the parent country with the regio specific strategy are likely to use tcns who are socialized in the regional headquarter and a multi domestic strategy are likely to use hcns who are socialized in the host country headquarters moving on to geocentric 
at the headquarters mnes with a geocentric managerial orientation recruit the best managers in the world regardless of nationality so the color of the passport does not matter is what they say firms following this type of orientation recognize that each unit of the mne system which is subsidiaries and headquarters they make a unique contribution with its unique competence it is accompanied by a worldwide integrated network and nationality is ignored it is the ability which is the most important so pcns hcns tcns can be found in key positions anywhere and in fact sometimes they go out and they may even uh, have an employee who provides the best fit beyond the pcn so there may be an external recruitment and not an internal recruitment regardless of the competitive strategy employed firms with a geocentric managerial orientation is more likely to staff its foreign subsidiaries with a staffing composition that is composed of local uh, global managers moving on to ownership by the parent company of the subsidiaries and how does it impact staffing one of the key decisions multinational enterprises have to make while investing abroad relates to their choice of ownership strategies of foreign operations it consists of two key decisions first the foreign investor need to decide an entry mode that is whether to make the investment by themselves in the form of a wholly owned subsidiary or make the investments in partnership with others in the form of an international joint venture if joint venture is chosen as the entry mode a subsequent decision that follows which would be the level of ownership to acquire should it be 50 50 should it be 40 60 so that's the next decision that they need to take these two decisions on ownership strategies have important implications for staffing and performance an important vehicle for establishing and maintaining organizational integration and control over international expansion activities can be accomplished by assigning the parent country nationals to foreign subsidiaries and manipulating the ratio of parent country nationals in the top management team so staffing control interrelates with entry mode control because both are major mechanisms controlling the resources of the organization the risk the management and the operations overseas so the staffing control and the entry mode control they also interrelate in such a way so that the entry mode that comes first entry mode selection is an ex ante control mechanism during international expansion while staffing is an ex post control mechanism during international operations so unless the overseas venture is staffed appropriately the parents objectives are unlikely to be realized so it's very important whether it is a wholly owned subsidiary which could be also a larger equity position in subsidiary it gives leverage to a foreign parent firm to appoint its own people which is parent country nationals to the board of directors and senior management positions such as heads of business divisions and general managers compared to local staff these managers these expatriates these parent country nationals are more likely to identify with the global strategic intent of the foreign parent firm and comply with the directives of its from its headquarters in the home country therefore ownership level in a subsidiary is related to the level of influence an mne can exercise in subsidiary operation however cases where full ownership is not feasible uh, for a, so then there is joint venturership so when full ownership is not feasible such informal 
forms of control such as participation in the planning process, reporting relationships, and staffing may be necessary to ensure successful performance of the subsidiary. In the picture, we have Peter Betzel, CEO of IKEA India. IKEA is the Swedish home products and furniture retailer, uh, which secured the approval of the Foreign Investment Promotion Board of India to operate wholly owned outlets in India. He is a German and who has been working with uh, IKEA for, for a long time and, um, and has had postings in various uh, subsidiaries of uh, IKEA all over the world and that makes him a global manager. What is also interesting is in India, he's a global manager and a TCN. He is not a Swedish origin. He is not an Indian, he is not an HCN. So he is a TCN here. There is an example of a TCN who is a global manager who is posted in India as CEO of IKEA. We have in picture also Starbucks, which is now headed by Naveen Gurnane. So what, when Gurnane was uh, selected as the CEO of Starbucks, which is a Tata Alliance, it is a joint venture by Tata and Starbucks, 50-50 uh, joint venture. What, it's, what read was, we are pleased to welcome Naveen Gurnane, who has a proven track record of success with Starbucks and is a business leader with the ability to bring people together as Tata Starbucks continues to innovate and position itself for long-term growth in the Indian market, said John Culver, Group President, International Channel Development and Global Coffee and Tea at Starbucks. Uh, what is interesting is about uh, Naveen Gurnane is he is, of course, of the Indian origin, but he has been working for Starbucks for a very long time. And hence, that makes him a PCM who, whose country of residence is the US. And now he is posted in India because of his Indian country of origin. Before him, uh, this position was uh, uh, he, in fact, he, he replaced uh, Sumitra Ghosh, who went back to the US after a three year stint. Sumitra Ghosh was also a PCN of Indian origin. So here we have examples of a joint venture, which is a joint venture between Starbucks and uh, Tata, which, is, uh, which has appointed PCNs of Indian origin. Of course, the first CEO of uh, Tata Starbucks Alliance was Avni Dabda. Uh, she, was, uh, she was at the age of 33. She was the youngest CEO in the Tata group. She, that made her a HCN who is socialized in the headquarter, which is host country headquarter. However, she, she resigned. And then after this HCN, we have always had PCNs, Sumitra Ghosh and Navne, Naveen Gurnane, PCNs of Indian origin as CEOs of Starbucks Tata Alliance. Let us now look at how subsidiary age or host country experience, the firm's host country experience influences staffing. Capra in 2011 stated that most MNC subsidiaries are begun with a team of expatriates followed by progressive incorporation of local employees, which is HCNs, who are, who are brought into the culture of India 
or wherever the host country is through extensive socialization process by which they learn the behaviors, values, beliefs, and social knowledge needed to perform their new roles. The typical trend is that MNEs appoint expatriates initially to manage foreign subsidiaries and then gradually as the subsidiaries mature, they are replaced by HCNs. So what happens is during the early stage of a newly established foreign subsidiary, the expatriate top management plays an important role in transferring knowledge and corporate values and strengthening the relationship with the headquarter. So the longer the foreign subsidiary operates in the host country, the more the advantages of the expatriate diminishes over time. And HCN employees learn the management practices and corporate culture of the headquarter eventually they internalize the values of the parent company. It is in the interest then of MNEs to train and develop HCN's host country national staff and managers accordingly. Some MNEs even have long term strategic talent development programs in place to, to often send host country nationals to expatriate assignments to headquarters so-called impatriation that we have referred to earlier to improve their social networks in the headquarter and at the same time internalize the values of the firm. So over time, localization of management becomes inevitable. What is localization? It is the replacement of expatriates with competent HCNs to take over the tasks that were originally performed by the expatriates. There is a dynamic process in organizations which leads to changing set of expatriate functions and staffing requirements to create and sustain the competitive position of the firm. Besides, localization also tends to increase local employee morale and financial performance in foreign subsidiaries. So it makes a lot of sense to localize the management over a period of time as the subsidiaries age, that is, the functions that were carried out by expatriates would be then carried out by the local nationals, the HCNs. In the initial developmental years, expatriate to local ratio may be high in order to properly socialize the, and train local staff, exercise close control over the initial strategic development of the subsidiary. In the early stages of the subsidiary, expats would be expected to perform a number of functions their role is very important in the initial stages. And what are some of the functions that they perform, which would be to foster the alignment, for example, establishment and build up of subsidiary operations, development and training of local employees, coordination with parent company, and at the same time, feedback of information from the subsidiary to the parent company. Often seen is a U-shaped relationship in expatriate staffing ratios, where the ratio of expatriates to local managers would be initially high, then low, and then increase again at, as the subsidiaries age. This upturn again, or upswing of the expatriates in the later years is interesting. And let's see how, why it may happen. It may not happen all the time, but it does happen in certain subsidiaries. So this upturn again of expats in later years of the subsidiary's development could be explained, for example, as when subsidiaries age, there may be a technological advance or strategic direction change, and that might require expatriates to regain control of the subsidiaries. Or as subsidiaries probably, as subsidiaries age, there may be a greater possibility that expatriate rotations overlap. 
the u shaped relationship may also be related to knowledge transfer between subsidiaries and headquarters and between various global units of the organization and how knowledge transfer needs may change over time high startup costs in subsidiaries in early years there is a high demand through high valuation of functions believed to be performed by expatriates they assist in the establishment of the subsidiary integration with home and other organizational units as the subsidiary develops there is a decrease in the demand of expatriates to perform certain functions as the local talent is by now developed and expatriates by then may be needed elsewhere to establish other subsidiary operations as the subsidiary further develops the value of the subsidiary and its relative size to the whole organization increases and one there may be a need for knowledge transfer from the subsidiary to the home or other operations which increases in highly matured subsidiaries it could also be for example to a good training ground for management development and here it's a good training ground without the high risk of strategic mistakes made by inexperienced managers in early years of subsidiary development so thus knowledge transfer coordination and control aspects between the subsidiary and the parent mne are particularly important during the initial period of subsidiary de development when expatriates can and they do play a critical role in developing resources and capabilities at the subsidiary however as the subsidiary matures these aspects become less important as the capability development has already been set in place and the role of these key employees become less critical staff availability is another issue staff availability appears to be a critical aspect on the one hand if employees which is the locals demand international assignments but lack the adequate skills extensive training is needed to expatriate locals which may not be always feasible by the company by the firm this reduces the retention capacity of this mechanism on the other hand if employees are reluctant to go abroad they are not always willing to go abroad expatriation will not be an effective inducement for retention either so staff availability is another factor that impacts staffing moving on to mne's country of origin i have put almost two classic cases of korean and japanese firms here we have uh, the screenshot of the operating officers of honda and we see that we have isao mizoguchi kori kosaka and if we go on you know nakao nomura or oshitu they are all they all seem to be pcns from japan so this would be a classic case of mne's country of origin in this case honda of japan that impacts the staffing of the chief operating officers who most of them seem most if not all of them seem to be of from japan or of japanese origin the other example as i said would be korea and here i have put in uh, the ceos of hyundai if we see dong hu choi president and ceo hyundai motor europe which is the regional headquarter is uh, he is of uh, korean uh, origin uh, seon seo kim ceo and md hyundai motor india which is the regional uh, headquarter of 
from Korea. Then we have Jose Munoz, president and CEO of Hyundai Motor North America and Hyundai Motor America from the regional headquarter, which is the regional headquarter, is the only exception who would be of Spanish origin, who is the CEO of Hyundai. And then we have Jun Hyo, CEO of Hyundai Motor Australia. So the country of origin, uh, which is Japan in the case of Honda, and the country of origin, which is Korea in the case of Hyundai, we see does impact staffing. We have uh, here Isao Mizoguchi, who is also the chief operating officer of Honda. In 2014, uh, there was a report that she is Honda's first foreigner and female board director. Interestingly, Mizoguchi is, of, uh, is, is a Brazilian of Japanese descent and she was named the first foreigner and first female to its all Japanese, all male roster of board members and operating officers, which was helping Honda to catch up with the rival Japanese car makers in diversifying its executive ranks. So what is strategic about, about this appointment of Isao Mizoguchi is she is an FCN, she is a Brazilian heading the, the South American regional headquarter. So we would understand her as an FCN. Yes, she is an FCN but she is of the parent country of origin. She is of Japanese origin. So the, she would be there to also bring in the Japanese culture because of her upbringing and the Japanese origin. So that is, that one would say is a strategic staffing by Honda. She is an HCN at the regional headquarter. We move on to uh, Bosch. Bosch India uh, has been operating in India through 13 companies. It set up its first manufacturing operation even before uh, globalization in 1951. We have here in picture is Somitra Bhattacharya who has been working with Bosch for 11 years and five months. He is the president and MD of Bosch India since January 2017. He succeeds Dr. Stefan Burns, a German who served as the MD Bosch India for almost four years. So what is interesting uh, about him is he is an HCN who has succeeded a PCN, a German Bosch is a German company and he succeeded a German who was a PCN. Uh, he's, uh, Somitra Bhattacharya is a chartered accountant. He started his career at the headquarter as a general manager, Bosch Engineering in Stuttgart, the headquarter in Germany. So he, he, he's a HCN who is socialized in the headquarter. Then he moved back to India to head operations in Jaipur, and Nashik and then moved on to Istanbul. So he was in that regional headquarter too. So in Istanbul, he was a third country national. He's neither a German, so he is not a PCN. He's neither a Turkish, so he's not an HCN, but he's an Indian in Istanbul. So he was a TCN and now he is back in Bangalore as MD and president of Bosch India. So he is an HCN who is socialized in the parent country, Stuttgart, Germany, who is headed operations as HCN in India, who has headed operation in Istanbul. So he is a true HCN who has been, he's almost a global manager who is heading Bosch India. And we have also seen since 1951 to now, Bosch 
India has matured and, and hence we see moving from PCN to an HCN who is heading Bosch India today. We have the recent announcement of the Indian giant IT Wipro to get its first non-Indian CEO, which is Thierry de la Porte. He succeeds Neem, Neem Muchwala. Thierry de la Porte is going to be the chief executive officer and the managing director of Wipro from July 2020. However, he will be based in Paris and will report to the chairman, Richard Premji, chairman of Wipro. I'm not going to discuss too much of Thierry de la Porte in Wipro because we are not discussing headquarter here. We're discussing um, subsidiaries. So this was just a reference point, but I'm going to discuss now Thierry de la Porte, who has come from Cup Gemini. He was the chief operating officer of Cup Gemini and a member of its group executive board during his 25 year career with Cup Gemini, which is a French multinational headquartered in Paris, providing consultancy, technology, professional and outsourcing services. He oversaw Cup Gemini's Indian operations. He led the group's transformation agenda, conceptualizing and driving several strategic programs across various business units from Europe to South America, Asia Pacific region, North America, Australia, New Zealand. So in his 25 year career in the company, De La Porte held a diverse portfolio across the, geographic, the geographies. And I would consider him as a true global manager. And we are not surprised that Wipro has today appointed him as the CEO and MD. With this, I finish my presentation and I would be very happy if there are any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions, please? Questions, if there are any questions, uh, <laughs> Questions. I would be happy to answer if you have any questions. Of 
our students here riya bhagat sanita solve pontad amale adu first year adu nadada 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 hmm hoga oh so in my last you are doing now my email yeah, okay and if you have any questions you can always contact no, lockdown mein chalo chodi thank you nala ke do na lo more than mani ne and en song mani ko ko sta bola maari noda pa en mari maari ni correction illa ni correction sedidya head will link up it ಇಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ನಾನು ಯಾವಾಗೋ ಮಾಡಿ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡ್ರಿ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಯಾರು ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಿರಿದಿಲ್ಲ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಯು ಎನಿ ಕರೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ವಿತ್ ಆಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಮೇಜರ್ ಚೇಂಜಸ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಇಲ್ಲ ಈ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಯಾಟ್ ಬೇಡ ಬೇರೆ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ಯಾಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡ್ರೆ ನನಗೆ ಮೇಲ್ ಮಾಡಲು ಫಾಜಿ ಹೋಗುತ್ತೆ ಜಗನಾಥ್ ರೆಡ್ಡಿ ಸರ್ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿಗೆ ಕೋ ಯಾರು ಸರ್ ನಿಮಗೆ ಮಾಹಿತಿ <laughs> 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 